The hunter warrior possesses a strange power. Though this power does not seem to be her own, she knows that it is at her disposal. All of her qualities are somehow the sign of this. The real secret, however, is that the last of her enemies, the terrifying mystery of life itself, has turned ally. She has wrestled the dread-filled wonder of existing to the ground. Now as friend, it walks the way with her, staying off the illusions which wait to consume her at every turn in the path of her living and dying. With regard to everything human, it holds true that the more one thinks about it, the better one understands it. With regard to the ultimate, it holds true that the more one thinks about it, the less one understands it. Is one therefore supposed to give up thinking about the ultimate? Fool, no. If possible, you are to use every moment for it. And with every moment properly used in this way, you will learn to wonder more. What is truth? How do we understand truth in our discussions, philosophically, theologically, every day, human? And I'm going to suggest that truth is related to two things very importantly, consciousness and reality. What it means to be conscious is to have a relationship to reality. And consciousness is part of reality, so consciousness being related to reality is also related to being conscious, or being a conscious human being. But both consciousness and reality are mysterious beyond belief, beyond understanding. So when I'm using the word truth, I'm talking about how you are putting together what your consciousness uh, is able to take in of reality, which is never, never, never the whole of reality. Uh, but truth is your way of having access or being in the process of accessing reality. So this relationship is just going on all the time. And so some, some way of understanding and being and accepting and living out of truth is always going on. And I fell into a family system that was part of a parish system, that was part of a church system that kept nurturing this imagination until finally when I was graduated from public high school, because they wouldn't even send me to a Catholic high school. When I graduated from public high school, uh, I went to a seminary college, Siena College in upstate New York, for four years. And then everything began to shift. It could have been physiologically that my brain was, the brain was doing its final stages of growth. But I was introduced to, I had been reading Watts since a teenager, but all of a sudden I was becoming aware of what was being spoken in these words. When he, when he said, in a, it was a, it was a July night when my family was sleeping and I was reading this book by Watts called um, Beyond Theology, The Art of Godsmanship. It's a lovely book. It's still in print, actually. And um, he, at the end of the book, he says, he uses a Buddhist frame of reference. And he says, we are God dreaming that we are not God. We are God dreaming. And I remember standing up from my seat at the kitchen table. Everyone was sleeping. This was probably 1 a.m. in the morning. And just going in front of the mirror and looking at the mirror. And it was this, and, and I had no idea of the Buddhist traditions of doing such practices. I just walked in and there it was. And then through my studies as a, as, as in Catholic theology, there was this magnificent paralleling going on of the mystical tradition where it, it moves from uh, c uh, uh, communion to union to identity with God. At 
that the indwelling of the Trinity is such that, you know, you hear Jesus say words like it's no longer, or St. Paul rather say words like it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me, or St. Augustine saying those same experiences. It's like, um, it, it, it is that you, you, when we come to eat and drink the body and blood of Christ in these rituals, it is your own mystery. You become what you eat. You're Christ dead. A Buddhist psychology perspective that's not so unlike other Western or psychological, neurological understandings of our consciousness. There's the background consciousness language in other traditions, but it's this understanding that there is a part of our activity of, of mind that's always operating. It's storing memories and impressions, it's consolidating things so that they, they can be brought up and used in other situations. It's the integrating of our experience that happens when we dream, for instance, or even it's what helps us get from point A to point B when we know the route and our mind is somewhere totally elsewhere, but we still get to the right place because that's our store consciousness that knows, oh, you turn right here and then you go left there. And when we're on a route that we know, that's not our mind consciousness that's getting us there. We're not actually thinking. It's, it's this other part of ourself. We talk about being on automatic pilot, but in some ways it's very helpful that we don't have to use because the mind consciousness uses a lot more juice, <laughs> uses a lot more brain sugar than the store consciousness. The store consciousness is this very efficient, much more effective than the mind consciousness. To walk, you can't think your way, with your mind consciousness, you can't do all the different millions of micro things that happen to move your foot and not fall over. That's your store consciousness that's doing all these things in your body that if you tried to think it through, you would just, your brain would blow up. <laughs> so many things like that happen throughout the day. Our mind consciousness could never keep track of, but the store consciousness can handle just fine. So there's lots that we don't need to think about, thank goodness, right? We can learn to entrust, to take refuge in this part of ourself that is so capable and knows how to do what it does. But our mind consciousness can work with our store consciousness in a helpful way to be conscious about, oh, here you are, you have this function, I have this function, the things I can't take care of, let me invite you to help me take care of, or things that are too big for me. Instead of what often happens when we can encounter a difficulty is our mind runs itself ragged trying to figure things out. That if we would just let go of for a little bit, so many like scientists have talked about their big discoveries coming when they were in the shower, when they were on a walk, not when they were in the lab, not when they were working that formula. And so it's the same with, uh, with anybody. When we're really tight, when there's a lot that we're trying to figure out relaxing, letting go of the difficulty or the question, giving more space, leaning back rather than reaching in to kind of leaning forward. All of that gives a lot more possibility to access the wisdom that's already in us. We, we all have incredible wisdom in us, not just from our own lives, but it's Store consciousness contains all of our ancestral wisdom too. It's why babies are afraid of snakes when they've never seen a snake before. That's the collective consciousness that's in the collective store consciousness. So there's the individual store consciousness, there's the collective store consciousness. So we can rely on it, not just from our own experiences, but from all the experiences of all generations. We have access to that. We're hooked up <laughs> to the big network. And so, so when we, when we stop trying to figure it out, me, as my little self, and we let ourselves release, and all of this good stuff that's under there can find us and sprout up without any effort. And suddenly we have the words that we needed, or we have the idea that we needed, or 
something just comes together or we just see it in this other way, but it doesn't come from trying so hard and wearing ourselves out. But that's how we're taught. We're taught to keep trying. If it didn't work this way, do it that way, until we're exhausted and burnt out and we have no creativity, no juice left. We have to stay juicy for these, <laughs> for the beautiful things to come, come forth. And that means stopping, it means letting go, it means relaxing, it means being more lazy, being more pliant, and seeing the many possibilities in a situation where we get stuck is when we think, oh, it has to be this way. That's how it will be resolved. It has to be this way. We don't see the whole picture most of the time. And if we come into this place where store consciousness can operate, store consciousness sees many possibilities. When we open to this other wisdom, it's like help can come from so many different directions. If we are receptive, part of what's important with store consciousness is letting mind consciousness fade to the background a little bit so we can be more receptive with this deeper part of our consciousness. That's why when we turn over this question in the form of a seed to store consciousness, store consciousness will take care of that. It will do its work. It is soil. If soil will grow a seed if it's fertile soil and our store consciousness is fertile soil. So it's part of it is the letting go, it's the trusting. This managing consciousness stuff is beginning to make me uncomfortable. I'm not certain I want to think about all of this. We are actually considering a realm of life experience that is much deeper than thinking. And if we wake up even a little, we might realize there is no escape from the deeper realities of life. I think I'll just put my attention elsewhere. Hmm. The, the marvelous uh, gift of God is that if you don't get around to the spiritual life or don't quite finish it, death will take care of the rest because it really, uh, there's nothing left of you, of us at that point. So, but it takes practice and so it takes time for each level of consciousness to make its contribution. Our own lives are the instruments with which we experiment with truth. Throughout human history, there have always been a small segment of the human family who were nobodies. And these nobodies were almost always nurtured by one of those great wisdom traditions. But these nobodies became practitioners of <coughs> intimacy with the infinite. These practitioners chose and choose today to practice their connection and their entanglement with the ultimate, with the universal, with the deep. If we are to renew society, once again, we have to give birth to that consciousness. It, were, it was the great wisdom traditions that provided the foundation for all culture in every corner of the globe. They provided the foundation for the economic distribution systems and political discourse and human morality and human education and how we human beings choose to relate to the physical planet and our environment. Today, we're getting our guidance from Disney World. The mystery-centered path through life is not the popular path. The human-centered path through life 
appears to make a lot of sense. It appears to make a lot of sense and it is certainly going to be reinforced as the popular response. But that path cannot transform consciousness and therefore cannot transform society. If we are to renew our politics, our economics, our education, our morality, our relationship to the environment, we have to get connected once again to the deep place. I'm getting the sense that managing consciousness, beginning with my consciousness, is the first step in creating a new world. Explore with me this new world discovered first in the heart of the consciousness we bear. It's a new day.